uh, I'm going to give you guys a, a kind of a brief introduction into USA Structures, um, why we're doing what we're doing, um, you know, status, current progress, and where we're heading. So um, why are we doing this? Uh, in 2016, the U.S. experienced 32 major disasters, um, and specifically six of those, six emergency declarations involving floods. Um, and that's when, you know, FEMA reached out to us. They needed some sort of um, contiguous data set um, identifying structures across the U.S. that they would be able to turn to um, during natural disasters for, for crowdsourcing to be able to attach different levels of damage and, and things like that. So 2016, they reached out to us um, to, to see what we could do. Um, and here we are, you know, six years later, um, and now we have a, a complete data set for all of the contiguous United States and its territories. Um, and I'll go into a little bit about, of about, you know, what the data set, set is, what type of attributions we have for each structure and, and how we developed it. Um, so this is, this is an eyesore, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a good single slide to show um, what we're doing or how we're extracting buildings. Um, so every good workflow needs an acronym. So we had to give it an acronym and it's SCRIBE, um, Scalable High Resolution Imagery Based Building Extraction. So there are three primary components for this. Um, the imagery pre-processing is actually a really big chunk. We receive um, our, we receive raw imagery from Maxar level 1B and we do all the pre-processing in-house. Um, to date, we've got Go, this, this slide's a little bit old. We've got over three petabytes of imagery to date. Um, and we handle all of that pre-processing in-house to get to a level 3A product. Um, and then once we have a level 3A product, that's when we focus on our machine learning algorithms for um, specifically building extraction. Um, so my bread and butter, and one thing that I'm very passionate about is training data and making sure that the training data that we have is representative of our target area and how can we kind of get the most bang for our buck in terms of training data representation. So that workflow, um, very robust, something that we've developed over the past six years. Again, um, another acronym is called isosceles. Um, and it's just a method that takes into account image spectral characteristics, textural characteristics, um, as, as well as building um, differences in building structure to to identify the, the, most, um, the most representative training samples to give you a more generalizable model. Um, and then the, the last step, once we you know, have identified the training data, developed a model, um, we then deploy the model. Um, we've, you know, we're Oak Ridge, we like to brag about the, the big fast computers we have. So we take advantage of that. Um, and currently the, it's funny, the average, uh, our unit of measurement for, for doing this is a turkey um, because turkey happens to be the size of an average country. So uh, we always joke, this is our turkey unit. Um, but it on average, it takes us about 10 days from start to finish to go from requesting imagery to having um, a raw building layer for the average size country. Um, this, uh, going in a little more detail about the, um, the training data, um, again, this is something that we focused really heavily on. Uh, one thing we found early on, which you can see from this map, um, there are no red dots in Texas or Louisiana. Um, that means we don't have any, any training data that we developed in-house for that area because we tried to rely on open source data and um, attach that to our imagery. Um, and I think a lot of you guys are very well aware some of the constraints with that, including you know shift between uh, you know, your, your source vectors with a different target image. Um, there's, there's shifting there, there's a temporal discrepancy. Um, so, and, you know, bad data in, bad data out. So we kind of learned the hard way with Texas and Louisiana um, that we needed to, to come up with a different solution. So that's when we, we developed isosceles and focused on let's, let's build our own in-house training data set. Um, and over the course of about five years, um, for the U.S., we have close to 60,000 training samples, and we've developed a, a really generalized, we call it global U.S. model. Um, as an example, for the state of Alaska, that was our last delivery, um, we didn't have any training samples from Alaska, 
in that model, but it still performed really well because we had, you know, taken the time and developed a really robust um, and, and generalizable training data set um, based on the other deliveries. So um, we're really glad, really happy to be at that point. Um, you know, we've put in that that initial time investment to get this really high quality training set, and now it's you know it's really paying off. Um, and here's some examples of what the the training data that we created in house looks like. Very precise. Um, you know, if you if you ask some of the the uh, geospatial analysts, you know, what is a building? Um, it's it's never cut and dry. You would think that it would be pretty simple, but we have very strict guidelines about what is labeled and what is not. Um, and we try to keep it as consistent as possible. Um, so in our in our US training set, we have about 25,500 positive samples, and that just means a sample that has a building within it. Uh, and then we have 33,500 negative samples. So there aren't any buildings present in those training sets, but the, we found that the negative samples are really, really important um, for reducing false positives in our modeled output. Um, so while those you know, those um, negative samples are really helpful in reducing false positives. We're still not perfect. Um, here's an example. Um, the, the red areas you'll see here are false positives. So instead of taking a manual approach to cleanup, we developed another machine learning um, algorithm, the, the verification and validation model to automatically assign a probability to all of our, each individual raw output feature um, as to whether or not it's a true positive or not. Um, and this is based off of a lot of different attributes associated with the, the shape and um, the way the, the polygons look. So here you can see um, some fields in Missouri, the, the red um, is false positive and our, our VVM model is picking up on those. So we, we throw those out um, of the output um, and that, that has saved us a tremendous amount of time having this um, an additional machine learning model to, to automatically flag some of the, the potentially problematic areas. Um, and one good thing about this is it's a cyclical process, right? So we can use what the VVM tells us and feed that back into our building extraction model to help it to improve. So it's, you know, it's improving two separate machine learning models. And that's, that's something that's been really beneficial for us to have. Uh, here's just a look at, at some of the output. Again, we um, we really wanted to make sure we had consistency across a large diverse area, which happens to be the U.S. So, you know, from Washington to Florida, Colorado, Pennsylvania, we're we're seeing some really consistent results for the most part. Um, while you know, extracting the the outlines of buildings is really critical. Um, it's also important to know what's going on with that building. You know, tell me more about the building. That's really critical for FEMA. So this is a look at our current schema. So for each building outline, we have all of this information um, for each of those, assuming data availability. Uh, anything in green is currently populated. Uh, anything highlighted in yellow, we've, there's a workflow method identified. Um, and for several of them, we've, you know, we've delivered, I think nine separate states with um, occupancy class, primary occupancy, address information, and some height inf information as well. Um, and this is this will go into the the longer term strategy where we're where we're heading. But this is a look at you know if you pull in the data set, and I'll I'll share a link um, with everyone after this if anyone wants to take a look. Um, but you're going to find this type of information for every single structure in the in the data set. So. Again, as of the 29th of December in 2021, uh, that's when we made our, our most recent delivery. Um, so across all 57 deliveries, we've got consistent metadata and schema for, for all of those. Um, we also have a unique building identifier, uh, what we call UUID. And this is really critical for emergency response, right? So if, if we can get more organizations to adopt the usage of this UUID, um, that that would be critical. Everyone using a consistent data set and crowdsourcing potential with that, um, that would be really huge um, in the middle of, of disaster response. So we're hoping that it gets adopted by more and more agencies and it, the data can continue to be enriched um, and improved. Um, we're also incorporating NGA's 133 cities, LIDAR drive structures where available. Um, 
And then for a subset, again, as I stated earlier, those uh, nine priority states, these are the most hurricane prone states, uh, we provided uh, occupancy type that's, you know, is this a residential structure, commercial, industrial, um, and then also primary occupancy. So is this a single family residential or multifamily? Is it a restaurant, hospital, that type of information um, for all structures using a variety of data sources. Um, and I'll go in a little bit into the details with the, the source data that we used for occupancy class. Um, so we had three primary sources, well, technically four. Um, first, Highfield Open, uh, great resource, something very trusted, and we actually develop a lot of the layers that are in Highfield Open at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, we also had some census housing unit data, um, and then also light box parcel data um, that we matched to a specific primary occupancy class. Um, so here at the top, sorry, I can't, my, uh, I can't read the, the, top, the top of the slide, so I'm not sure, uh, I can't remember what uh, can somebody tell me what it's saying before based classification? Buildings with high field based classification. That's it. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so yeah, the the high field data set has really been critical, and again, where it's a really high quality data set, something that we trust a lot. So we wanted to make sure we were leveraging that. Um, and here's a look at just those those nine priority states. How many structures um, we had with high field land uses? So. Um, definitely a lot, a lot of government, obviously, but this, this data set definitely um, came in handy. Um, so again, we've got high field, some census housing unit data, light box data, but there isn't complete coverage for any of these. Um, so next we developed another machine learning model we, we call res type. Um, so that's just filling in the gaps. So anywhere that we don't have ancillary data to inform us of what the, the land use is. Um, we have another machine learning model that basically assigns a residential or non-residential category to, to a structure. Um, we're hoping to get a little more refined with that, you know, so instead of just non-residential, say it's commercial or it's industrial, but that gets a little tricky just based on the, the feature shape, right? So um, for now, it's just residential versus, versus non-residential. Those those two are a little bit easier to distinguish. Um, and so far we've, we've currently achieved about an F1 score of 87% for both residential and non-residential classification results. So we're, we're very pleased with how well that helps us in areas where we're, that are data poor. And here's just a look at what you can expect if you, if you pull in the data. Um, so this is specifically in New Orleans. This is, these are what the, the structure outlines look like. And you, here's a good look at um, all of the fields that are populated um, for each of these. Um, with regards to the primary occupancy for hospitals, FEMA specifically wanted to know, is this a public or is it a private hospital? So that's something that we populate as well for them. Um, you have, you know, source information. So what, what's the source of the, the image that was used to derive this building? Is it LIDAR? Is it imagery derived? You know, you get all the details um, associated with that building um, that we're able to provide at the time. And again, you've got that, that UUID as well that I think will uh, be really critical for, for disaster response. Speaking of disaster response support, um, we've, we've been able to, to support a lot to support FEMA a lot for several disasters over uh, recent years. Here's three different examples, the car fire in 2018, uh, the Hawaii lava flow in 2018, and then Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, and that, you know, to me, that's, that's what gets me up in the morning. You know, like this is, this is why we do what we do. Um, being able to help people in real time um, is really important. Um, and we actually kind of stumbled upon this on accident that, hey, we may be able to do some damage assessment work for FEMA or, or kind of give them an idea of the extent of damage. Um, and there, we came across it by accident using this example, which is Joplin, Missouri. Um, we were delivering the Missouri state level data set and we noticed a, a big swath that it looked like maybe it was hazy in the image, but there was a ton of omission and we weren't sure what was going on. And come to find out when we looked a little deeper, it, the images over Joplin were immediately post-tornado. Um, I think that was 20, somebody will have to help me out. 
um, 2012 maybe. It's been a little while. Um, but we found that our, um, you know, our building extraction model did a great job of omitting structures that had been completely destroyed. So assuming that we have, you know, pre-event imagery and then post-event imagery, we can really quickly get an idea of what's the difference here in structure count, um, pre-event and post-event. So that's something that, that we've done um, pretty frequently for FEMA as well. Uh, here's a look at how USA Structures was used recently in the um, flooding that happened nearby here uh, in Waverly, Tennessee. Um, they, they used USA Structures as a starting point for crowdsourcing. Um, so people could, could add in, you know, is minor damage here, major, destroyed, or is it just affected? Um, and then FEMA posts that um, on their online portal for people to access. Here's another more recent example, the, um, the tornado that went through uh, Mayfield, Kentucky. Um, similar usage, you know, the, the crowd could assign a, a damage level to structures and then FEMA can use that um, in the field and in their, their response, they're gonna know which areas they need to, to focus, to prioritize. Um, so what's next for us? Um, so the next steps, we, I, I mentioned those nine priority states um, where we populated um, occupancy class and primary occupancy and address information if available. Uh, next steps are to do that for everywhere else. You know, we've, um, I think FEMA has been really pleased with those nine states. Uh, it's come in handy, you know, even yesterday and this weekend with some tornadoes and um, going through New Orleans and, and other places. So um, we want to make sure that we can, we can do that for the rest of the states. Also, we want to, to leverage the, the three debt data that's, that's available now. Um, having so much LIDAR data across a large area is, is huge. So we want to make sure we can leverage that and start populating some of those um, elevation related fields. So height, highest adjacent grade and lowest adjacent grade using 3 Um And also ingest data from state and local sources. Um, we know that our, you know, our structures aren't the best everywhere. And there are definitely, you know, county level, state level, um, and governments that have much better data available than us. And we wanna take advantage of that. Again, this USA Structures is completely public. Um, that's one thing we wanna make sure that uh, whatever data we're providing, there are no use restrictions, nothing like that. It's open to the community, um, but we wanna make sure we're leveraging the best data um, that's possibly available. Um, so those are, those are kind of the three primary next steps. Um, and this is just like a bragging moment image for me to show, um, how well we've done, this is, this is output. So this isn't training data. So this is raw output for, for the building model. And um, this is something I like to show the people um, who are responsible for the building training that, you know, your work paid off. Um, whenever we, we focus on detail, this is the kind of output that we get. So um, we're really pleased with, with the quality of output that, that we're seeing from our model. Um, so that's about all that I've got. Um, I would I would love to open it up for questions, discussion, um, anything that that you guys have.